Chapter 3, Canadian Push. That I essentially am not in madness, but mad in craft. Hamlet 3, Act 4. It was greed. They killed their own brothers. Money talks. Biker enforcer Norman Brisbois on the Quebec Biker Wars. It's impossible to talk for long about boxer Muscadier's banditos without noting the influence of the Hells Angels, the world's largest biker club. The Hells Angels planted a flag in Canada on December 5, 1977, when a Montreal-based gang called the Popeyes patched over, or switched allegiances, to the U.S.-based biker club. The move was aided by New York State Hells Angels, who stood to gain a tighter drug trafficking network north of the border. It also offered the American Angels a firm base in Canada for further northern expansion. In time, other strong clubs in Canada might join the Angels too, falling like dominoes as the club went global. The Popeyes, the patchover, promised dominance over other local clubs with whom they had been warring for drug turf. Since the Angels were international and careful about whom they led into their ranks, the Quebecers could be confident that they wouldn't be ripped off in drug deals by their new brothers, even if they didn't know them personally. There was also power of the Hells Angels patch. The Popeyes may have been a tough, sometimes murderous group, but for anyone looking to intimidate a rival, it's hard to beat the Angels, wing school logo, and its implication of far-reaching international muscle. Among the founding members of the Canadian Hells Angels was five foot six inch, 135 pound, Yves Apache the Mad Bumper, Trudeau, who also became the first Canadian to sew a filthy few killers patch onto his leather jacket. He preferred the old school look of a leather jacket to the more modern vest. The Bantam sized biker wasn't particular about his victims. He killed enemies, total strangers, and fellow angels with an equal disregard for human life, as long as the price was right. In time, Apache Trudeau was recognized as too truly dangerous for even the Hell's Angels. He narrowly escaped murder himself when members of his Montreal North chapter were invited to a church or club meeting at the Lennoxville Clubhouse, home of the Sherbrooke Hell's Angels, only to be slaughtered by their brothers. The bodies of the five visitors were wrapped in sleeping bags, weighted down with barbell plates, and dumped into the club's unofficial graveyard, the dark, cold waters of the St. Lawrence River. Such is the fate of bikers accused by their brothers of excessive drug use, violence, and stealing money from the gang. With the values we had at the time, it was the only solution, the massacre's architect, Ray Jean Zigzad Lassard, would later say. Years later, an invitation to Lennoxville Clubhouse would still provoke a certain chill in even the hardest one percenter. Don't worry, the Quebec Angels would say in a display of dark humor, you don't need to pack a sleeping bag for the trip. Many police officers speculated, hopefully, that the Lennoxville slaughter and the police roundup that followed meant the Hells Angels had hit the end of the road in Canada. Surveillance was cut and police priorities shifted. What happened next was a biker version of Darwinism, as the surviving Canadian Hells Angels morphed into something much more dangerous in the early 1990s. Under a new leader, Maurice Mom Boucher, the Montreal Hells Angels began working out in gyms and refrained from heavy drug use, especially crack cocaine, or anything that involved the use of a needle. Boucher, who was himself a recovering drug addict, wanted his members to be loyal to the club, not to narcotic habits, and also realized that the drug use made them weak and more likely to chat with police. The revitalized fitter Hells Angels pushed out from their old strongholds in the Montreal suburbs and into the city's downtown core, where there was plenty of money to be made dealing drugs. Under Boucher, the Montreal Hells Angels became big business, developing direct ties to South American drug suppliers. Before long, they invested with the Mafia as equal partners in massive cocaine and hashish shipments. Gone were the days when the Hells Angels in Quebec merely peddled other people's illegal merchandise or acted as muscle for hire. There were fundamental differences between Mom Boucher's Hells Angels and the organization run by Vito Rizzuto, the most powerful man in the Canadian Mafia. Both groups moved cocaine and hashish for profit, but Rizzuto took the standard Mafia pose that he wasn't a criminal just a misunderstood businessman. For years, Canadian mobsters even denied that there was such a thing as the mafia outside of Hollywood movies. Carmen Galante, 
a New York mobster who hid out in Montreal in the 1950s, once told a reporter, between you and I, all I do is grow tomatoes. Outlaw bikers take an entirely opposite tack. They wear uniforms to announce that they don't respect the law and bluntly challenge authorities to catch them. In downtown Montreal, some independent drug dealers tried to find a middle ground between the styles of the Mafia and Les Hells Angels when they formed a club of their own, The Rock Machine, in 1989. It wasn't really a motorcycle club at all. Members didn't have to own a bike to join. What brothers Giovanni Johnny and Salvatore Cassetta sought to create was a cohesive confederation of drug dealing groups with a lower profile than bikers clubs like the Hells Angels. Some rock machine members even committed the cardinal biker sin of riding Japanese sports bikes, faster, sleeker, and more anonymous than Arlie's. Rock Machine members also chose not to wear leather vests or jackets emblazoned with the gang's crest and colors, since they didn't want to make themselves easy targets for police to photograph and identify. Instead, they sported diamond-studded gold rings with an eagle's head design. If you put patches on your back, it was like saying, Chase me, man, said Gillis the Kid Lalandi, an enforcer with the Dark Circle Gang, a heavy-duty collection of experienced bikers who were aligned with the Rock Machine. Still, early Rock Machine members were nothing if not cocky. They set up their bunker-like Montreal clubhouse just three blocks from the headquarters of the Provincial Police, the Surrette de Quebec, as if to taunt the cops. They invested $90,000 to buy the brick house and several times that amount to fortify and furnish it. On its inner walls, a few rules were posted. One forbade members from using cocaine, although they could smoke marijuana and hashish. Another rule was that members were expected to kick back a percentage of the money they made from drug dealing to the club. Yet another rule was that biker brothers inside the rock machine must be respected. In those early hopeful days, there was also a sticker on the wall referring to a group the rock machine founders still considered friends, Hells Angels Forever. Johnny Cassetta knew Hells Angels boss Mom Boucher from the 1980s when they were members together in a small bike gang called the SS. Others in the rock machine had golfed and gone to boxing matches and strip clubs with Boucher and Vito Rizzuto. They assumed their friendship would continue with the birth of the new club, and at first, things were chummy, as rock machine members were happy to deal drugs supplied by the Hells Angels. In the early 1990s, rock machine members could strut into the Castle Tina, a strip club on John Talon Street, east in Montreal, that was run by Rizzuto's close associate, Paolo Javasi. There, they would sit at their own private table on the main floor, where Vito Rizzuto sometimes dropped by to sip grappa and talk business. Through Gavasi, Rizzuto hired bikers connected to the rock machine to do security work and dirty enforcement jobs. The pay scale for trashing a bar so that it went out of business was between 5,000 and 10,000 cash, and the mafioso always paid on time. On a larger scale, Rizzuto was concerned about the growing power of Los Angeles, but didn't want to go to war with them himself. It was in his interest to prop up the rock machine to a point while not angering the Hells Angels enough to provoke them. It was a delicate balancing act, but such brokering was Vito Rizzuto's forte, and he considered himself a mediator, not a gangster. In Vito Rizzuto's perfect world, the rock machine would be strong enough to blunt the angels' power but would also lack the clout to challenge his mafia. There wasn't widespread alarm when the Hells Angels killed a couple of Rock Machine members in the early 1990s. But a few more murders brought the chilling realization that Boucher wanted all the drug profits from downtown Montreal for his angels, even if it meant killing off his former golfing buddies. In the opinion of Norman Burbois of the Dark Circle, the bloodletting was unnecessary as there were easily enough drug users to make all of them wealthy. While a philosopher might say that there was enough sun for everyone, drug dealers had their own expression. As we say in business, the apple pie was big enough for everybody, the boys later said. It was greed. They killed their own brothers, money talks. Within a few years, any pretense of fraternity between the Hells Angels and Rock Machine was washed away with blood. By the summer of 1997, there was a sickening regularity to the funerals in Quebec as the body count approached 100. Each murder drove Boucher wilder, and he raved about his desire for hits on cabinet ministers, judges, journalists, and prison guards, in addition to rival bikers. 
He reveled in the imminence of his own impending death as he drafted funeral cards of himself perched on a Harley Davidson. But it wasn't a fair fight. The Rock Machine's Dark Circle hit squad was lethal, but was outnumbered almost five to one by the Hells Angels. The Hells Angels were 10 times more powerful and organized than us, Raboyce later said in an interview. The Rock Machine was more like just drug dealers, the Lonely said. They weren't much of an organized club. The Hells Angels was more like a big business. The best the Rock Machine could hope for was a bloody standoff in a never ending war, unless they dramatically altered the battlefield by enlisting powerful allies. Rock Machine founders Johnny Plessio, Fred Voucher, and Robert Tout Tout Ledger flew to Sweden to forge ties with Scandinavian members of the Hells Angels' arch enemies, the Bandidos. If anyone could go toe to toe with the world's biggest motorcycle club, it was the fat Mexicans. The Rock Machine's leadership had been impressed by the fighting spirit shown by Nordic Bandidos in their own very public war against the Hells Angels, which was fought not with fists and broken beer bottles, but with machine guns, grenades, and rocket launchers. 11 people were murdered and 96 were injured between 1994 and 1997. With friends like that, the Rock Machine might be able to turn the tide. Young members of the Rock Machine were eager to patch their club over into the Bandidos' fold. Perhaps the lure of Bandito membership would help them recruit other young bikers. Or maybe the increased firepower would convince less angels to back off. As they attempted to pull closer to the Bandidos, the Canadians didn't give much thought to their new club's strict set of bylaws or their love of Harley Davidsons. They thought they would have more people join them to fight the Hells Angels, but Boy says, I don't think it was anything else. The center of bandito power remained in the U.S., and George Bandito George Wedgers, who held the dual post of international president and U.S. national president, visited Quebec in October of 1997 to meet the suitors face-to-face. -face. Wedgers was from Whatcom County, Washington, well outside the bandito center of power in the Gulf states. Aside from Texas, the Bandidos also claimed Washington and Montana as their territory, meaning other clubs had to get their permission to set up chapters there. By Bandido status, Wedger was considered liberal, which was a relative thing. It meant he stopped members from wearing racist patches and outlawed stealing from junior members or beating them without real cause. He also favored international expansion, feeling that if an organization isn't growing, it's dying. There wasn't time to say much more than hello before someone tipped off authorities and Wedgers was ordered out of the country. On his way out, Wedgers advised the Canadians to strengthen their relationship with the American Bandidos to win over their support. The Rock Machine's task would be to convince the Americans who ran the club that they were indeed outlaw bikers and not just gangster drug dealers who occasionally roared about motorcycles. The topic of the rock machine cozying up to the Bandidos was high on the agenda when Canadian Hells Angels West Coast officers met in November 1997. Club Minutes recorded that they had a video of Wedgers meeting with the rock machine. The Bandidos still had no chapters in Canada, but the Hells Angels were watching them with more than a little concern. The Bandidos weren't the only one percenters contemplating expansion. Even a veteran biker cop would have gasped at the sight on Highway 401 in June 1993. Heading westbound on Ontario was a formation of Hells Angels stretching back as far as the eye could see. Police tallied up 94 Hells Angels and associates from junior affiliate clubs like the Satan's Guard, Rowdy Crew, and Evil Ones. At the front of the pack, patched on one of his Harleys was the club's national president, Walter Wallermeyer Nergit Stadnik. At his side was road captain David Wolf Carroll, who also wore a filthy few crests above his heart. The bikers rode in mass to the resort town of Wasaga Beach on Georgian Bay, north of Toronto, where they were greeted by members of the Loners Motorcycle Club. Yellow tape was used to cordon off a strip club, some motels and cottages on the town's low rent east side, close to the main beach and a half dozen blocks from the Ontario Provincial Police Department. Five dozen Harleys were parked in neat rows outside the club, where the establishment's regular sign was covered with the thick black flag featuring the Hells Angels logo. Anyone not invited by the bikers was ordered to stay on the outside of the tape. Among the privileged few allowed into the makeshift inner sanctum were strippers who gamely climbed over the tape in high heels, carrying their costumes in plastic grocery bags. Inside the yellow tape, Frank Cisco Lentia, 
the Woodbridge loners pose for a picture with Stadnick and Carol. The latter wearing a t-shirt bearing the slogan, Filthy Few Denmark, and two lightning bolts to underline the fact that he was considered a killer on two continents. The front of Statnik's vest featured a rocker and the word world, another reminder of the scope of his club. Both Hell's Angels had their arms around Lenti, who sported a loner's t-shirt adorned with a Confederate flag. Wolf Carroll stared straight at the camera without smiling, while Stednik grinned and Lenti looked a little uncomfortable, like the meat in the filthy few sandwich. Wolf Carroll stared straight at the camera without smiling, while Stednik grinned and Lenti looked a little uncomfortable, like the meat in the filthy few sandwich. Perhaps as the photo was taken, Lenti was thinking back a half dozen years to when he was in the Outlaws, a traditional enemy of the Angels. Back then, there were rumors that Satan's Choice members were plotting to murder him and another outlaw to impress the Hells Angels. Things took an ugly turn later that weekend at Wasaga Beach. As is often the case in the outlaw biker world, as in more mainstream family squabbles, it was a small thing that threatened the attempt at civility. A senior British Columbia Hells Angel asked a loner to get him a beer, and the loner rudely suggested that perhaps the Hells Angels should get it himself. In about the time it takes to say, Molson Canadian, more than two bikers began pushing, shoving, and telling each other to fuck off. Somehow, violence was averted, but the angels seemed to have not forgotten the insult. A year later, they flexed their muscles more effectively than they could have done in the bar, ordering the loners to change their club patch, which featured a red confederate flag. The angels said the loners' use of red made it too close to their own deathhead patch of a greening wing skull. The loners complied, although some members privately bristled. Bristling publicly about the Hells Angels can be a dangerous game. However, it would be another five years before the red and white publicly showed their strength again in Ontario. The Loners Club Rodeo, north of Toronto, in August 1998, promised a weekend of brotherhood, booze, and bikes in the mud by Lake Simcoe. Members of the Paradise Raiders, Red Devils, Vagabonds, Last Chance, and Satan's Choice Clubs were in attendance, sharing laughs. Some bikers competed in a slow race in which the goal was to be the last to cross the finish line. Riding the lumbering Harley as slow as possible without falling over is no easy feat. In another test of skill, a biker would ride under a wiener which dangled by a string while a woman perched on the back of his Harley would try to bite it. The champion was the woman with the biggest chunk of wiener in her mouth. The mood that summer weekend abruptly turned frosty when members of the Hells Angels Nomads chapter from Quebec rode in. Almost immediately, the Vagabonds Club from downtown Toronto got on their bikes and left, obviously still not forgiving the Angels for the murder of club president Donald Snorkel Melanson a decade earlier over unpaid cocaine debts. Like many others in small Ontario clubs, Melanson had been a partier, not a businessman, earning his nickname for the prodigious amounts of cocaine could snorkel up in his prominent nose. But not everyone rode off in protest. Some of the Ontario bikers were impressed with the Quebec visitors that afternoon by Lake Simcoe and asked if they could take pictures of them with their FF patches. The angels complied, though they demanded that they be given the negatives once the film was developed. That weekend's rodeo marked a turning point of sorts in the Ontario outlaw biker scene until Les Hells rode in there had been a healthy social scene between the very Ontario biker clubs. Brotherhood, even between clubs, was more important than business. The existing clubs had also used their collective muscle to keep the angels from squeezing in and dominating things. From that moment, it seemed as though every development in the biker world was seen through the lens of how it affected the Hells Angels. Bikers were expected to decide whether they were for or against them. The middle ground disappeared as the red and white tide advanced. It was hard to escape the feeling that the sun was setting on a kind of golden age for the Toronto outlaw bikers. That year, a half dozen Quebec Hells Angels quietly moved into the greater Toronto area and made themselves visible by frequenting the area around Western Road and Highway 7 in Woodbridge, north of Toronto. The Hells Angels were still courting the loners, but it wasn't an easy relationship. The following summer, the Toronto-based Paradise Riders were the Hells Angels' preferred group. In May 1999, Glenn Ronway Atkinson received a fax at the collection agency where he worked, inviting him, Pietro P. 
Peter Pepe Berea and other notable loners from the GTA to a party at the notorious headquarters of the wealthy Sherbrook chapter of the Hells Angels in Lennoxville, about 140 kilometers east of Montreal. Unknown to the Toronto area bikers, there was a business agenda that drove the invitation. The Angels wanted to discuss the strained relations between the loners and the Paradise Riders. The Angels were now close to the Paradise Riders and wanted the loners to explain themselves. Locals they asked for directions shied away. After to become involved in the doings of the Angels and this group of menacing outsiders. Finally, a police cruiser pulled them over and the cops offered to lead them to the compound. What the loners saw was completely beyond their experience of biker clubhouses. The Angels' headquarters are set on an 11 hectare lot, situated defiantly on a hilltop atop the killing ground of the five Angel Brothers with 465 meters fronting the thoroughfare. Rather than retreat from the ground where their one-time brothers had been slaughtered, the angels seemed to celebrate the grim deed and the reforging of the club that followed. The central, sprawling, multi-level buildings looks like a hotel on steroids. At the very pinnacle of the main building, above the bright red steel roof, a red flag emblazoned with the club's grinning wing skull, death head, symbol flies like a jolly rancher to get to its fortified front the visitors had to pass guard dogs floodlights and burglar alarms at the front door a biker politely but firmly told atkinson and his cohort not to bring illegal drugs inside if you have anything like that leave it in the hotel he said in heavily accented english do not bring it inside inside a large room was like a nightclub with loud techno music playing a sharp change from the leonard skinner who and Led Zeppelin popular in Toronto area clubhouses. Some of the older angels seemed a bit annoyed at the sound, but it was clearly the playlist of choice for the younger, well-dressed, weightlifter types that made up the majority. Former National President Walter Stadney greeted the travelers at the door, addressing Atkinson by his first name. Hey Glenn, how you doing? The men had never met before, but like any biker, Atkinson knew of Stadwick, who played the role of Cavival host. Our house is your house, Stadnik said, except for one room. The Ontarians had shown they were true bikers by making the trip from Ontario, despite the tiring ride and daunting destination. The biker wars with the rock machine were raging, and the angels were themselves cautious about riding in public in their colors. So the loners were treated with the respect one percenters show other true bikers, which included a well-stocked buffet of food and noble off-duty strippers. The bar was as extensive as anything you see in a high-end nightclub, and one wall of the living room was entirely covered with the map of the world, with LED lights showing all of the Angels' 190 clubhouses from Oakland, California, to Auckland, New Zealand, from Costa del Sol, Spain, to West Rand, South Africa. In the bathrooms were photos of mirrors with lines of cocaine. Around the pictures of the cocaine was a red circle, and another red line ran through it, the universal symbol not to do something. Bikers may be attached to the idea of doing whatever they want, but it can prove hazardous to want to do a line of coke in a bathroom owned by the Hells Angels. All of the compound was spotless, even the two-story garage, where there was a television, stereo, lifts were working on bikes and racks of replacement parts. The loners were free to use whatever they wished. Help yourself, just clean up when you're finished, an angel told them. A Quebec police study once found that the Hells Angels in the province were shorter than the average male Quebecer. Perhaps the goal of the study was to support a hypothesis that the angels labored under a Napoleon complex in which physically small men overcompensate for what they see as their own shortcomings with excessive aggressive controlling behavior. Whatever the case, Stadnik who stood just five feet four, transcended the theory. Despite his compact frame, there was something undeniably huge about the man in the clubhouse where he played host. It was about big crime, big money, big stakes, big risk, and big profits. And in this world, there was no one bigger than the lord of the Lennoxville Manor, Walter Stadnick. Stadnick was low key and genial as he asked Atkinson about common acquaintances but it quickly became clear to Ontario bikers that their smiling host was not just making small talk. Stadnik knew exactly where Atkinson and other bikers in the GTA lived. He was privy to many intimate details of their lives, like the names and activities of their girlfriends and spouses. 
He didn't say such things in a threatening manner. He didn't have to. The very walls of the Lennoxville clubhouse spoke to the possibilities of murder. Moreover, Stadnick was sitting with henchman Wolf Carroll, himself a living, breathing threat to anyone at cross purposes to the angels. Carroll was genial and soft-spoken at first. Then his tone changed as he asked the visitors about Gennaro, Jimmy Russell, the loner's president. He wanted to know why Russell hadn't come to Quebec with the others. His tone was insolent, as if goading the visitors to defend their absent leader. As Carroll's anger built, he called Russell a pussy and a man with no balls, and it became easy to envision Russell as more fish food at the bottom of St. Lawrence. As Carroll's anger built, he called Russell a pussy and a man with no balls, and it became easy to envision Russell as more fish food at the bottom of the St. Lawrence. It was understandable that the Hells Angels coveted the GTA, where there were more than 5 million residents and no Angels or Bandidos chapters to provide them with illegal drugs. The Angels bristled at news of a party at the Loner's Richmond Hill Clubhouse in June 2000 that was attended by about five dozen machinists, the Loner nickname for the rock machine. Machinists outnumbered loners two to one at their own party, and it was clear something was brewing between the two clubs that the Angels wouldn't like. The Hells Angels point man in Toronto was Danny Kane, a junior member with the Angels Quebec support club, the Rockers. Unbeknownst to the Angels, Kane was working as a paid police agent, and his notes for that month stated that Wolf Carroll wanted him to kill members of the loners named Jimmy and Peter who were considered the club's top leadership and muscle. Jimmy and Peter were certainly Rosso and Pepe Berea. Kane was given photographs of club members to identify as targets and paid a visit to a former loner who had moved on to the Paradise Riders. Shortly afterwards, Kane told his police handlers that Carroll aborted the murder plan, saying that too many people knew about it. But the Hells Angels' real business was not with small clubs like the loners. There was only one real challenger for turf in Canada, and that was the Bandidos. On November 28, 2000, Richard Dick Maynard of the Elite Nomads chapter of the Hells Angels in Quebec telephoned Wedgers of the American Bandidos, identifying himself only as Dick from the Hells Angels. Mayran needed to meet face to face to sort some things out. He couldn't enter the United States because of his criminal record, while Wedgers had already been expelled from Canada because of his biker ties. They agreed to sit across from each other at a picnic table, straddling the Canada-US border in Peace, Arch Park, between Blaine, Washington and Surrey, British Columbia. The cross-border park had been named Peace Arch as a tribute to lasting amity between the two countries. That day, however, things looked anything but peaceful as the senior bikers sat face to face, each flanked by bodyguards, with Myran sitting in Canada and Wedgers in the United States. The agenda for the meeting was short enough, but it was not likely the two leaders were going to reach a consensus. Mayran wanted to discuss troubling reports that the Bandidos were about to grant membership to Canadian members of the Rock Machine, while Wedgers gave little sign that he was inclined to see things from his rival's point of view. For over an hour, Mayran talked while Wedgers sat still and listened, poker-faced. He delivered his response three days later, the equivalent of giving Mayran and the Hells Angels the finger. At a banquet hall in Woodbridge, the Bandidos granted probationary status to 45 members of the rock machine. The ceremony was so rushed that no fat Mexican patches were ready to hand over to the new members. Even though there were no crests, the message was clear. The Bandidos Motorcycle Club had now officially planted its flag in Canada. Wedgers probably didn't expect the Hells Angels in Quebec to accept the provocation meekly, and in December of 2000, they loudly answered back. Some 168 members of established Ontario clubs, including the Saints Choice, Paradise Riders, Lobos, Loners, and Last Chance, arrived at the Hells Angels Biker Clubhouse in Laval, outside Montreal, in sport utility vehicles. A van brought an industrial strength sewing machine to stitch the Angels' grinning skull patch onto the vest of new members who gave up their old clubs for membership in the world's biggest biker game. The club dropped its standard probationary status for new members, which they usually depended on to screen out the unfit and potential informers. With the massive stitchery, the greater Toronto area was suddenly home to the largest concentration of Hells Angels chapters in the world, a half dozen with an 80 kilometer radius. It was an audacious gambit, but it seemed to have come straight out of Sun Tzu's The Art of War. Generally in war, the best policy is to take a state intact. 
to ruin it is inferior to this. That classic book of military strategy written in the 4th century BC advises, whether Nergit Stadnik or other senior Hells Angels were taking a page from Sun Tzu's playbook or just responding to a slap in the face from the banditos, the only way they knew how, they had pulled off a major coup. The red and white had finally captured the greater Toronto area without a shot being fired. <laughs>